So this is going to be fun. <laughs> um, so the idea of this um, is, I think, at least to me, it's sort of based on uh, a competition that's very popular in the UK and I think around the world, the three-minute thesis where as young researchers, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this or experienced this, where you have a single slide and three minutes to explain a concept. And that is what we have challenged our 10 laureates with uh, today. Um, some of them have been flexible, let's say with the one slide. Um, others have ignored it completely. Uh, one of them has 11, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but I, I am going to apologize to everyone in advance, especially our speakers. I will have to be strict on time. So if I come on stage to interrupt you again, I apologize, but I think it's the only way this is gonna work. So the three minutes will be pretty, pretty harsh on the cutter. Um, okay, and whilst this is happening, um, as well as obviously focusing on the talks, I want to throw out a little puzzle um, to, to the young researchers in the audience. There is an order to the talks I'd like you to try and think out what that order is, okay? Right, so first up, um, we have John Hopcroft, who will be talking about a road to a successful career. So John, if you wanna come on stage. Um. And you will have to stand next to these microphones, if that's all right. These ones here, these ones here. So. You'll have to stand here, yes, because these microphones are picked no up. Slide. And no slide. Perfect. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about how, how to have a successful uh, career. I, I have talked to many uh, Turing Award winners, Nobel Prize winners, and I've asked them, what was your strategy to be so successful? And they said, I had no strategy. But what they told me is that... Um, if there was an interesting topic came along or something to do that they were excited about, they took it. Otherwise, they ignored it. And so actually, they did have a strategy. And their strategy is do what you really enjoy and like. And I, I want to talk about uh, different uh, a aspects of your career. Um, if you're in a PhD program, um, my, my theory is if your advisor tells you what to work on, it's probably not a good idea, uh, unless he happens to hit something that you really enjoy. What you should do is talk to a number of people, go to lectures and so on, and when you hear something you're really curious about and you think would be fun to explore, do it, and you'll, you'll probably be successful. And uh, one of the things I will talk about is uh, you might be curious if the uh, mission of a university is to educate the next generation of talent, how come top universities in science and engineering departments are hiring researchers? And it turns out the answer is very simple. There's a reason for it. Uh, when you hire a faculty member, you're hiring someone for a 40-year career. And what you want to hire is somebody who is curious and has energy. And what you don't want to have happen is have the person 30 years from now teaching material that's 30 years old. If something changes in the field and he's curious, he's probably going to explore it and probably add it to his uh, course and upgrade his teaching because we're really interested, not in the research that they're doing, but in their curiosity. Um, and many, uh, I think, universities have the wrong measure when they're looking for faculty. Uh, it's not the quality of what they may have done in their PhD thesis, it's why they did it. How did they pick what they did? If, if they just simply extended what their advisor was doing, that's probably not a good candidate. But if someone says, I started this curious, on this curious problem, and I was working, I discovered this other idea, which is more exciting, so I switched, and then again I switched. 
so what, the one message I want to leave you with, you, you get one career to live and you ought to enjoy it. And the way to enjoy it is to really follow up and do, if something comes along which you find uh, exciting and interesting, do that. And um, don't worry so much about the number of publications or research money, because those things are not relevant. Thank you. Thank you, John. Three minutes and 24 seconds. Just, it's all right. <laughs> OK, um, thank you, John. Um, so next, we have uh, Shigafumi Mori who will be talking about rational curves on algebraic varieties. Shigafumi, yes. <laughs> so if you just go to the microphones there. Fantastic. All right, thank you. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that the, that the talks are uh, ordered in the, by, by the number of uh, slides. So I, <laughs> I use one slide. <laughs> Oops. Ah, okay. So uh, I don't need it. So the, the first, the, the top one, uh, let X be a smooth projective variety of dimension n over complex numbers. The first statement is the the key result I proved to uh, in order to settle. Uh, uh, Frankel and Hudson uh, conjectures, which roughly says that uh, if a variety is uh, curved positively in uh, everywhere and in every direction, then it has to be a projective space. So maybe I should explain a little bit. Uh, so a variety is a, is, a, is, a, is a shape defined by algebraic means. And if, uh, uh, if you think of a, a soap bubble, it's curved positively like this or in all directions. And if you think of a, a, a whole saddle, it goes up and this way. So this, in this case, it's curved negatively. And uh, in this case, we're asking the, the uh, positively curved varieties. Okay? And the, the, the first result says that uh, uh, if minus k is, uh, no, let, let's go to the second one. If minus k times a uh, curve C is positive, this means that uh, uh, the curvature uh, of the, the variety along the, the curve in average is positive. Then there is a rational curve. So uh, this, uh, this honestly looking uh, differential geometric statement uh, have improved only by going to characteristic P. And when, uh, when I proved uh, the uh, Frankel and Hudson conjectures, uh, I was told by uh, differential some of the differential geometers that uh, they want to uh, settle it by uh, characteristic zero argument without going to uh, positive characteristic. Uh, so far, no one has succeeded. And uh, recently, uh, in 2020, there's a paper by Kao and Horing, uh, which says uh, something uh, in that direction. So, uh, but still, uh, it's far from uh, the, the kind of statement I wanted. So details, some details are put in the, the bottom line. So, oops, oops sorry, I... <laughs> Three minutes, 10, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I think the three minutes is harder than the one hour. Uh, we can all agree on that. Um, thank you, right, so third up, we have uh, Butler Lampson, who will be talking about the safety of the Internet of Things. Um, and there is a clicker here, should you require it. Thank you. Sorry, I have two slides. That's not one of them. <laughs> uh, here we go. So the question is, how are we gonna stop IoT devices from killing people? 
This is not really a big problem today, but I don't think there's much doubt that it's going to be a problem in the future. Uh, to, to consider just the simple example of a smart traffic light. Uh, it's got cameras looking at the come oncoming traffic. It talks to neighboring traffic lights. It talks to the city traffic controller. It has 30 million lines of code. It's full of bugs and certainly plenty of opportunities to hack it. There's no doubt about that. And there's nothing much we can do about that either. So how are we gonna make it reasonably safe? Well, we only know one way to make, to be confident that software is gonna work. And that is you have to keep it small and simple. No other methods are known. And many other things have been tried and none of them has worked. And also, it helps a great deal if you buy, get first-class programmers to work on the problem. So what that means is that the, your system is gonna have to be structured according to the picture at the bottom of the slide. There's gonna be a big pile of code, which I've labeled mass, uh, which is the 30 million lines of code that looks at the cameras and whatever. And then there's gonna be a very small amount of code, which I've labeled monitor in red which is, is going to guarantee that the system remains safe no matter what the mass of the code does. So in the case of the traffic light example, it's pretty clear how to, how to do this because the only thing that is safety critical, loosely speaking, is that the traffic light should never be green in both directions. And we definitely can build a piece of software that enforces that property regardless of what instructions it's given. Um, there are, that's an artificially simple, it's a realistic example in some ways, but it's an artificially simple example in others. So how do you go about uh, building such a monitor? Well, there's two aspects. One is what I call the hygiene aspect, which is has, the monitor has to be isolated from the mass so that bugs in the mass can't affect it. And you have to, it has to have a decent spec so that you can be confident. If you say that the, if you think the monitor is working, that only means that it behaves according to its spec. Um, in, in Gary McCraw's immortal words, if a system does not have a spec, it cannot be wrong. It can only be surprising. <laughs> um, and, and, and thirdly, you need to be able to update it to take account of the fact that in spite of all this effort, it is gonna have problems. That's the easy part, we know how to do that. And in fact, Microsoft actually used to have a product called Azure Sphere that does that, all those things pretty well. The hard part is architecture. You have to design the system so that it actually has a monitor. And I explained how to do that for the traffic light. But for example, for, if you want to do a self-driving car, it's very unclear how to build a monitor. In fact, I don't have any idea how to do it. I know I have two strategies for building monitors so far. One of them is the guard monitor, of which the, the traffic light is a good example. It, it, it um, filters its inputs to, to guarantee safety. The other is the handoff monitor, which when things get tough, it hands off uh, responsibility but to a human. And of course, it's not quite as simple as it looks because there's time constants involved. If you, hand off too, if you hand off too quickly to the human, the human won't be prepared to respond. So I invite you to think of other ways of solving this problem. There's gonna be a big demand. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll just keep this swift. Um, Madhu Sadan will be next with reliability in cumulative knowledge. Madhu, stay to this. You could just be there. In case you're wondering who had the uh, 11 slides, that might be me. Um, <clears throat> so quickly, I want to say that, you know, societal knowledge, I want to think about a, an information theoretic approach to looking at it it's always going to be noisy and it's cumulative. How do these two effects go together? So for instance, I mean, you might be coming up with a drug design idea today based on work that was done about protein folding in the past and maybe some math literature that you needed to uh, invoke. And then maybe this in turn depends on cell biology and then you go back and you have some <coughs> you know, basic interactions that you have to understand. So societal knowledge is always built like this, and this could be applying to some math theorems. This is actually a real example where I did see this chain of uh, uh, things going backwards. 
And what happens if you start having an error somewhere in this reasoning? You know, some one piece of reasoning has gone wrong, but others depend on it. So everything that depends on this in principle can go wrong. And this is something that we do have to worry about as a society, as we go along and we keep building on the results and researches of others, are we going to have the time and ability to go back and check everything that we rely on for a current result? Or are we going to somehow say, okay, look, you know, this has been around for a long time, let's just trust it. And mostly we do the latter. And a question that we might all want to understand is, is this reasonable, is this not? Okay. So this is a, an important question for general, uh, um, you know, all kinds of researchers to investigate as mathematicians. We did this with some mathematical model, and this, here are my co-authors who worked on this. And, you know, this entire paragraph set aside, well, it can be done. You can uh, build some mathematical models which are simple, probabilistic, and study what's going on. And, you know, I can't get into the details of what the modeling says, and very hard also to get into the details of the theorems, but at least let me give you a flavor. In order to check, it's not good enough for you to check your own results very, very carefully. It's not good enough for you to just go look at your immediate ancestors, you know, the, the immediate parents, the results that you depend on directly and you cite in your paper. You have to go up a few levels before this process is going to guarantee stability into the future. On the other hand, the good news is actually a few levels and a lot of checking does suffice. It's not as if over time you have to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the literature in the past. You only have to go around checking a constant number of rounds. Okay. That's all I had to say. Thank you. That was 11 slides in 2 minutes and 44 seconds. That, that could be a world record, I think, <laughs> right there. <laughs> Incredible. Um, okay, so our, our fifth speaker um, in this session will be Vince Cerf, who will be uh, discussing interplanetary internet. Okay, we're going to build an interplanetary internet. Uh, TCP IP ought to work on Mars, it works on Earth. Oh heck, the speed of light's too slow. Uh, it takes 40 minutes for stuff to go to Mars and come back. Round trip time at the worst case, seven minutes to the other case. Uh, so what's going to happen? Well, um, let's see. Maybe we can uh, store stuff uh, in the network when we get from Earth to Mars and we're on our way to Jupiter, it'd be stupid to throw everything away, so let's store things in network. That doesn't happen in the internet world. Uh, what about DNS lookup? Well, that's a problem. Uh, you look something up uh, from Mars and you want to go to Earth and you get the answer back 40 minutes later and the IP address is different because the thing was moving. Well, that doesn't work. So you better figure out which planet you're going to first and then decide how to get, after you get there, how to get to the destination. Uh, uh, what about network management? Well, ping isn't your friend because you don't have any idea how long it's going to take for something to come back, so we better design a network management system that deals with variable delay and uh, disruption. Oh yeah, there's another problem. The planets are rotating. We don't know how to stop that. So, uh, so you have to prepare for things that are going to go out of uh, communications. Geez, the topology of the network varies because the antennas can point in different directions. You have to decide where to point. And you also have to lead the destination because, you know, it's going to take a while for the signal to get there. So guess what? We've developed a new suite of protocols called the Bundle Protocol Suite because Bundle sounds a little bit like packet. It's been standardized by the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems. It's been on the International Space Station for about 10 years now. Uh, it has been on Mars and prototype form since 2004 for the uh, Spirit and Opportunity rovers and all the rovers since that time, and we'll be on board the Artemis mission as it returns to the moon. So if you're interested in a whole new protocol suite and a whole new way to do internet, I'm the guy to talk to. <laughs> oh, and that one was exactly two minutes. Very impressive. Okay, um, thank you, Vin. Um, next up, we have Joseph Safakis, who will be talking about testing system intelligence. Joseph. Oh. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, 
the idea to uh, compare human and machine intelligence go, goes back to Turing who proposed the famous Turing test uh, that involves an experimenter sending questions X to a, a human and a machine and collecting the answers and Turing said that uh, if uh, uh, the experimenter cannot distinguish between human and machine the two uh, are uh, equally equivalent. Now there are generalizations of Turing tests that are behavioral tests as the one we have proposed uh, some time ago. Uh, I would say that uh, a machine is as intelligent as a human driver if uh, it can perform the task uh, according to given safety criteria. So in this uh, comparison, what is important is a predicate that compares says if uh, a response is correct with respect to an input and uh, it's easy to understand that uh, uh, deciding the behavioral equivalence is uh, boils down to a testing problem and we know that uh, testing is uh, an essential part of what we call scientific method we have uh, different test uh, techniques so a test uh, method allows uh, uh, to design a set of finite experiments that allow the experimenter to decide uh, with what probability, what, what likelihood uh, P is uh, valid. And for this, the experimenter needs in fact two functions, a coverage function that uh, measures the extent to which uh, uh, the, a set of inputs explores the behavior of the system and the score function that computes the likelihood that, that uh, the P is satisfied. And in fact, there is here a very strong requirement that two functions should be uh, related by this requirement here that guarantees the reproducibility of the tests. So the requirement is that two different experiments that have the same coverage should uh, have a similar results. Now, to conclude, I would say that today you have a lot of publications that uh, uh, would like to uh, aim to build AI systems that uh, meet the human-centric properties. And you see here people talk about responsible AI, uh, AI ethically aligned and things like that. And what I would like to say here is that uh, applying the scientific method uh, to AI systems uh, needs uh, some uh, uh, theory, some test theory. For instance, it's impossible to apply the scientific method to LLMs, for instance, because the relationship P, the predicate P, cannot be uh, uh, formally specified. And also we have no coverage criteria and there are other technical difficulties. And on this I will stop. I think it's very important to develop some uh, testing theory for uh, uh, AI systems. Thank you for your attention and if you are interested in details, I wrote a paper about that. Thank you. Three minutes ten. It's pretty good. Um, okay. I like how my job is now just to tell you exactly how long all the talks are. <laughs> uh, right, so next up we have our seventh of the 10, we are flying through these, uh, which is Eric Brewer, who will be talking on open source is a public good. Eric. This is basically a public service. Uh, the purpose of this is to point out that kind of open source is one and is widely used. You're all carrying it around. It's in every phone, it's in every server, every cloud. Uh, and that part is not too troubling. I think what's more troubling, it's also in all of our infrastructure, uh, clouds being one kind, but also water supplies, electrical grids, and pipelines, and hospital systems. And despite its ubiquity, it's not yet as trustworthy as we need it to be. So we collectively as a society made a giant bet on open source. It's actually a good bet in the sense of its greatly increased productivity, but it's not a good bet in the sense that it's trustworthy. So we collectively, all nations, need to make it worthy of our trust. And that's not easy to do. I've started on, actually I have a slide. Let's go with my slide. No, it didn't, wasn't up there, right? The, uh, we're already starting to see attacks. Uh, uh, there's been attacks on electrical grids, not if they involve open source or not, but even things that are not open source completely have tons of open source inside. About 90% of enterprise software has open source inside somewhere. 
So these attacks are, go from very simple things like there's a logging library that everybody uses that was used at 8 million places. Even now, only 4 million of those places have been fixed because it's hard to fix them all. And by the way, volunteers are not a great way to fix stuff that we depend on, right? So that's a pretty fundamental uh, issue here. And in fact, it's kind of like, would you say, I want volunteers to fix my roads? Roads are a public good and a shared infrastructure and a common investment. But roads cost money every year for maintenance. And we expect that our taxes go to maintenance to fix our infrastructure. Well, guess what? We have software infrastructure too. It's vastly cheaper to fix than physical infrastructure, but it's not zero. <laughs> and today we spend zero fixing it. No worries. So I would say I've taken many different steps here to, to work on this problem recently. Uh, I created a foundation called the Open SSF, which is working on this problem, particularly for supply chain security, but even basic open source security. We've had pretty good luck getting governments involved. You might have heard the US had a cybersecurity executive order. Uh, there's also been work in the UK and in Germany. In fact, I met with Germany recently on this trip. Uh, so there is, I think, an understanding that, you know, societies depend on open source, but we're not there yet. <laughs> so I want all of you to know that this is a, a problem for us to collectively solve and to get our nations interested, because the answer is not going to be don't use open source. We're way past that point. The answer has to be, let's figure out how to make it trustworthy. Let's figure out how to make it sustainable. Thank you. And apologies for <laughs> moving the mic. We just couldn't hear you for a moment, that was all. Um, right, yes, yeah, so Daniel's already beat me to it. So <laughs> Daniel Spielman is gonna be our eighth speaker uh, with a talk entitled Computer Experiments for Computer Science and Mathematics. Every few weeks, I have an idea I am so excited about, I can't sleep. Uh, having watched this for decades, my partner says, don't worry, go to sleep. You'll find the mistake in the morning. <laughs> Uh, if I wake up and I haven't found the mistake or the proof, I start coding up a computer experiment to find a counterexample. And if I don't immediately find a counterexample, I start trying to prove the theorem. But I leave the code running for days, weeks, or months while I'm working on finding the proof. Here's how I set it up. The theorems I'm trying to prove usually have the form, like for all x, something is wonderful about x. X could be a number, a vector, a graph, a matrix, or something more complicated. I find counterexamples by constructing a function f that is negative precisely if x is a counterexample. And I then try to minimize f. I find an x for which, try to find an x, the smallest possible x. I'm not really principled, and I don't have to be well principled in my approach to this minimization. There, it's a black art. There's all sorts of heuristics for minimizing functions. You can't prove much about them. Sometimes they work. I try all of them. I only listed a few here. Many of these functions want a vector input. So I have to implement another function I call g that takes an arbitrary vector and maps it into an x in the set about which I want to test my conjecture. And then I have this problem of minimizing f of g of x. And computer experiments can help me prove my theorem. When I'm trying to prove a theorem, I break it into lemmas that would imply the theorem. And I look for counterexamples to those. And if I find counterexamples, then I come up with different lemmas. When this works, it almost feels like cheating. The computer tells me which are the wrong paths in my search for the truth. But it's not cheating, because you still need insight to come up with the true statements in the first place. There are dangers of this approach. Just because you can't find a counterexample doesn't mean something is true. There are many famous false statements with no small counterexamples. And just because you find a counterexample doesn't mean the statement is false. It could be a bug in your code. Um, but the benefits far outweigh the dangers. The very act of coding the function f forces you to understand your conjecture better. And when you don't find counterexamples, you often find critical, tight cases that inform your proofs. Implementing computer experiments can be intimidating at first. You may have to learn something about coding to do it, but it will lead you to appreciate new parts of computer science. 
I promise that the more you do it, the easier it gets. So my advice to young researchers is to start experimenting now so you can get good at it and do it for the rest of your career. Okay. Three, three minutes and six seconds, almost. I know Daniel practiced. He came to tell me he would practiced <laughs> to get it perfect for timing. Right, um, next up, Martin Hellman. Uh, friends are better than enemies. So I've got a slide, let's see. Where's my slide? Like I said, I didn't put it up because it's supposed to be a couple of pictures. Uh, friends are better than enemies is something I've talked about in earlier HLFs and one of, at one of the farewell dinners when one of the young researchers was asked what she'd learned at HLF, which she said surprised me, friends are better than enemies. <laughs> so today I'm going to condense that down into a short talk. The first picture was supposed to show John Gill, who has been a friend of mine since he came on the uh, faculty at, MI, at Stanford in 1972. He was a pioneer as one of the first black graduates of Georgia Tech when segregation was being challenged in the southern United States. John knew more math than I did. His PhD advisor was uh, Turing laureate Manuel Blum. So when I started working in cryptography, I asked John for useful mathematical functions. One of the, his suggestions was discrete logarithms, although he called them indices, he's a mathematician, which led me to what's now called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, and it's one of the main reasons I'm here today. Thank you, John. The second picture was supposed to show Admiral Bobby Inman, uh, who was director of NSA, that's the super secret American National Security, uh, National Security Agency, and he was director when I first started publishing my papers in cryptography. Loosely speaking, and maybe more than loosely speaking, he wanted to throw me in jail for doing that. Why? Because NSA maintained that I was breaking the law by exporting technical data on implements of war. That's because the law defined anything cryptographic as an implement of war, and I was publishing in international journals, which was exporting it. But in 1978, Admiral Inman paid me a visit uh, to try and stop the war that had developed between NSA and myself. As a result of Admiral Inman's efforts, that cautious first meeting evolved to the point that today we're good friends. In fact, I've talked to him almost weekly recently. Uh, and he has signed several statements and letters in support of my work, most recently on the need to rethink national security in the nuclear age. While Admiral Inman would not have signed that statement if he didn't agree with it, he also wouldn't have signed it if we were enemies rather than friends. He wouldn't have trusted me. Friends really are better than enemies. But few people and even fewer nations are willing to take the risk of trying to do that. So thank you, Admiral Inman. Thank you, Martin. Um, that one was, for those of you who still care about this, that was two minutes and 33. It's very good. Um, okay, so this does bring us to our final uh, speaker of the session, uh, which is Alexi Efros, who will be talking about advances in visual computing. All right. So uh, I'm actually going to talk about the most exciting thing uh, that I think happened in the last 10 years in computing, which is generative models and uh, the, the, the kind of sequential models that, that, you know, using lots of data are able to do great things in text, in pixels, in audio, any sequences. And um, we are going to have a whole uh, uh, session on Friday on this. And for now, I just wanted to mention uh, one, I think, interesting connection that a lot of the of a lot of the ideas that these models are using actually came from two great mathematicians, uh, Andrei Markov and uh, uh, Claude Shannon. Uh, so in 1913, Markov published a not very well known paper where he analyzed a piece of text, uh, uh, Pushkin's uh, uh, Eugene Onegin's, using uh, bigrams. And then, of course, in 1948, uh, Claude Shannon, in his uh, uh, incredible theory of communication paper, had a little paragraph that says, oh, by the way, here is a way that we can generate English-sounding text. Uh, and basically the idea is you assume a Markov property, 
and then you basically uh, build uh, probability tables given a, pick, uh, a letter uh, for every letter you know given uh, given a previous set of letters, you know, what's the probability of that letter? And then you just sample basically that Markov chain and you you can do it also on words and we can actually do this right now. So let's do a uh, uh, a two word example. So given a seed we need, well, what's a what's a what's a most probable word? Well, it's some probably one of those short ones. Uh, the two, so there's a two, okay? Now we shift the context to say need to, need to some verb, right? Need to think, need to eat, Okay, now shift again, and if, if this is a text about the French Revolution, then cake is probably highly probable. There you go, generated our sentence here. And actually in the 80s, in Bell Labs, they had a program called Mark V. Shaney that was trolling the internet, posting as a human uh, with germs like, uh, you know, I spent an interesting evening recently with a uh, grain of salt. So not quite there, but this is early 80s, right? And Fundamentally, the main problem with n-gram models is that fixed context, uh, fixed context size, right? So if your context is too, uh, too, too short, then you, know, you, don't, you don't basically get enough of the kind of richness. If your context is too long, you run out of data. So basically, that's, that's what's been solved by transformers with self-attention. And the rest is history. Thank you. Alexi, thank you. Um, and that was two minutes 44. Uh, and unbelievably, we have somehow finished one minute early. Uh, which I <laughs> genuinely didn't prepare anything because I thought I was going to be like, oh, I'm sorry, we ran over. Please go and have a coffee break. Um, but I guess I did pose a question at the beginning uh, as to what might the order be of our speakers. And I wonder whether anybody is feeling brave enough to hazard a guess as to what it was. Oh, there's quite a few hands over there. Um, let's go for, yes, if you want to just shout out, sort of, yes, yes, that person right there, yes. Yes, amazing, it was the year of the award. So well done to any of you who figured that out. Um, very good, very impressive. Um, so just, leaves me to say um, a huge, huge thank you to all of our, our laureates. As, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm sure um, there are a lot of young researchers in the audience. I certainly remember doing this during my PhD, sort of who've been through this three minute, very short presentation uh, thing. And we know how stressful it can be. So we appreciate that you were all very good sports um, in, in taking part in that. And I think it was a very, I certainly enjoyed it. <laughs> and I hope all of you did too. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>